So how much do you know about buying a used car? I bought my first car, my father came with me. So has he got new doors or something? I don't think I'd buy this one from you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, it doesn't look in bad nick. I wouldn't know at all. I, wouldn't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we should be told a lot more about how to buy a used car. It seems that wherever you look, there are cars for sale. The choice is virtually unlimited. But when you're buying a car, you definitely don't want to be lumbered with the wrong choice. Buying a second-hand car is a very serious business. Over five million used cars are bought and sold every year. But while it's one of your biggest and most important pieces of personal expenditure, Many people enter into the deal knowing little or nothing about what to look for in the car of their dreams. I drive cars for a living, and I know better than anyone else that ill-judged, misinformed choices could not only cost you a lot of extra cash to put right, but make the wrong decision, and the problems could even cost you your life. And so, this is what this video is all about. We want to give you a very straightforward, easy to understand guide on what to look out for when you choose your next used car. Importantly, none of what you're about to see and hear is rocket science. You don't have to become a qualified mechanic overnight. It's all stuff anyone can pick up and use to their advantage. Obviously, this video can't be the definitive answer. And at the end of the day, the decision on whether to purchase a car or not is yours and yours alone. But we hope you'll make good use of some handy tips from me and my two used car experts. Douglas Coker will, for a fee, hunt down the right used car for his customers, so his reputation depends on making the right choice. And Douglas is joined by Gary Webb. Gary worked for a major motoring organisation specialising in the inspection of used vehicles in both dealer and retail outlets. So just how do you tell whether this car is going to give you years of trouble-free motoring or be a real dog the moment it becomes yours? And where's the best place to start looking for that deal of a lifetime for a superb little runner? Let's go and find out. Um, I think I'd be very, uh, be very cautious, actually. Because anyone who's trying to sell a car is going to make it look as good as possible. I think it's been clocked. When they say, I want cash, they say, you've got to be really careful about buying your car from the auctions, and that's what happens. They don't know their history. When cars are bought and sold, you have to remember there's a little bit of the Arthur Daly in everyone. It doesn't matter if you're normally a saint, you'll do whatever you can to get shot of your old motor as quickly and as painlessly as possible. Rule number one, never trust anybody. Always use your own good judgment. So where do you start? What are the pros and cons of going to an auction house, going to a dealer, or buying privately? Douglas Coker spends his life amidst the cut and thrust of the major car auction houses. Is it the right place for everyone to look for a great deal? Car auctions can be a really good place to get a good deal on a used car. Um, you have to be careful though. What I'd advise that you do is that you come along knowing what car you want. Then try and focus on ex-fleet cars. You can expect them to have been well maintained. You can ask if they've got a service history. You may be, you may be lucky and even get a service printout with lots of detail about the servicing. In addition, these cars often come with uh, an engineer's report and that will indicate to you any major faults of the vehicle. At the same time, some of them also come with a warranty. It's a limited warranty. You have one hour after the end of the sale to check if the car is up to scratch. In addition to X-Fleet cars, though, I'd recommend you look at 
Uh, big distributors trade ins. They may, maybe don't want them for quite a valid reason. It may be the wrong make of car, it may be a bit too old, maybe have slightly too many miles on it. But have a look at those, and you can also pick up a bargain amongst them as well. A word of warning though these are busy, hectic places. Things move very fast. You can see it going on behind me. Um, there's a lot of pressure. You have to make a decision very quickly. You don't get a terribly long period of time to look at the car. So don't buy on your first visit. Make sure you have three or four visits to become familiar with the procedures. You need to know which cars are going through which hole. You need to know the running order. And please, stick, stick to your budget. Don't get carried away with, with auction fever. And um, if you do all these things and you concentrate and keep cool and calm and collected, and uh, we wish you luck, then you may get a very good deal. Sound advice there from Douglas. So what about dealers? Here's a word or two of advice from Gary Webb. There are two choices for used cars on the high street. One is the authorised manufacturer's used car centre. Some are good and some are not so good. On the plus side, you usually get a warranty and you'll probably get a multi-point check. But remember, it's not an independent report. The other choice on the high street is the used car centre, usually run by an independent. Again, some are better than others. Check reputations with neighbours and friends. Pop into the shop next door and ask them what they know about the dealer. Beware of signs that say AARAC inspections. If there's an independent engineer's report, ask to see it before you buy. And don't be intimidated. Take your own checklist that you've made from this video with you and ask questions. And then take the car for a good test drive. Finally, if you're after a specialist vehicle, your best bet is to go to a specialist dealer. They know their product and they've probably got a reputation to protect. If you do decide to buy privately, basically you're on your own. There's little or no legal comeback if something does go wrong, and you're probably assessing the person as much as the car. Beware the used car dealer purporting to be a private seller. But how can you spot those rogues? Well, they're the guys who definitely don't want you to come and see them. They insist on bringing the car to your home, or you can only contact them via a mobile phone, or on a specific telephone number at a certain time and that's because they're standing outside a call box. Steer well clear of these characters because it'll all end in tears. To sum up, exert great care when buying privately. As with buying from an auction house or from a dealer, make sure you wise up on car values before you buy. The Motoring Press offers any number of guides to average prices for different makes of used cars. Check and compare so that you've got some idea as to whether the price you're being asked is fair or not. Stick to what you can afford and be prepared to haggle. The seller is probably asking for more than they really expect to get at the end of the day. But wherever you go, try not to buy on emotion. Try to be detached and practical, even if the car in front of you is just what you want. Take a step back for a minute to examine what you're really getting. At least try and walk into the deal with your eyes open. Here's some more advice from Douglas. You may well be very clear about the car that you want, but it's a good idea to see if you can find an example to familiarise yourself with. Ask around, check with your friends and colleagues, and try and locate the car that you're interested in. Um, ask these people what kind of experience they've had of owning the vehicle, they may be able to tell you about the running costs, how reliable the car's been, and also whether they've been happy with the choice that they made. They may feel they've made a mistake, in which case you may not want that vehicle either. If you can arrange proper insurance, then ask the friend if you can take this car for a test drive. And what you're looking for on this test drive is to become familiar with the vehicle. You need to know what kind of noises it makes typically, how it feels on the road, and how it feels in different situations. Once you've done all that, you're in a very good position to go off and search for your own new car. The section coming up next is all about the documentation. What is it you need to look for when sorting out the paperwork? If I was to buy it, then obviously I'd need to see the paperwork. Uh, there's a few documents here, yeah, but I don't know which ones they are. Well, you want the logbook, the main thing. You can swap it for mine, I'll bring mine. <laughs> Possibly uh, the insurance as well. If I was buying a used car, I'd probably have a screwdriver. And uh, obviously if the bloke can drive a car with his driving license.
our experts say don't even look at any car until you've given the paperwork a thorough once-over first. Check the registration document. This is also known as the V5 or logbook. It contains a lot of useful information, not least of which is the number of previous owners that the vehicle has had and the vehicle identification number, otherwise known as the VIN number. Check that those VIN numbers on the registration document match with those on the car. Ask the owner to show you where they're located. If they can't tell you, the owner's manual will. And if the seller appears to want to discourage you from looking for the VIN numbers, our recommendation would be not to buy this car under any circumstances. It could be what's known in the trade as a ringer, a vehicle that's been stolen and had false plates put on it to match the number shown on the registration document that's for a different car which has been written off. Or it could be a cut and shut, where two halves of different cars that have suffered severe accident damage have been joined together to make one. Provided it's been declared when you buy the car, building one car out of two isn't actually illegal. But it's still not necessarily the wisest buy for all sorts of obvious reasons. Mind you, I have to warn you, there are all kinds of ways for the clever crook to disguise fake VIN numbers, so even if found, they can't always be trusted. If buying privately, check whether the registration documents show the same address as the location you're visiting. If not, why not? If relevant, look carefully at the MOT. There may be something iffy about a car that's had its MOT done miles from where it's being sold. And if there are no plausible answers to why there are these anomalies, walk away there and then. There's something up and you don't want to be a part of it. Of course, even the documents can be forged and some can be a very professional job. But one thing the MOT should have is this embossed stamp. Also, check the number plate against the number on the registration document and the MOT to make sure they're the same as each other and the one on the car. It sounds obvious, but it wouldn't be the first time someone's tried to pull a flanker with stolen documents from a totally different car. Check the registration document to see how many previous owners the car has had in its life. Up to three or four is usually acceptable. Five, six, seven or eight probably isn't. Don't go any further, walk away. It's also very important to check whether the car has been serviced and ask to see if there's a service record, either the service book itself or receipts for work done. You want to know that the car has been looked after. If they don't have either, tread very, very carefully. Other less obvious things to look for when making your first impressions are to look to see if a tow bar has been fitted at the back. The car may have done some very, very heavy pulling. Also, what sort of stickers are there on the car? These can reveal a great deal about the seller and the state of the car. National Trust and World Wildlife Fund stickers suggest a certain degree of caring and sobriety that may have been reflected in the owner's driving style. In contrast, a sticker bearing the legend Mega Death may also give a clue as to how the vehicle has been treated and driven in the past. Whilst one that's got every city in Europe in the back screen has obviously been round the clock. What you're trying to do is to build up a credible, believable picture of the car, its owner and how it's been looked after. If some of what you discover doesn't ring true for any reason, then your best bet is to leave well alone, no matter how desirable and tantalising the car may look. But assuming all is well, then it's time to start to explore the bodywork. And that's coming up next. Look for the rust. Some of these blokes are blooming good at repairing them. Does this mean it's been painted, doesn't it? Been sprayed? Before I go and look under the seals. You can check the colour, the paint, see if it's had a respray at all. Well, it's not new for stories. All the way around to see if it's been in an accident, it should have been welded or cracked. 
Our two experts recommend you buy a car in its original form rather than a glorified dog's breakfast. Body kits, spoilers and go-faster stripes can be used to hide a multitude of sins, particularly rust and serious dings. Being realistic, any car three or more years old is going to have some minor damage to its bodywork. But how do you tell whether it's been in a serious accident or not? To find out, I'm going to hand you over to Douglas and Gary for their thoughts on the matter. There, there are a number of points to look for when you're trying to assess whether a car's had serious accident damage or not. Uh, very important, the number plates. We can see on this one that it looks original, VW Audi logo, an old style number plate, which tells me that I think that the front of this car has not been damaged. I'd be hoping to see exactly the same style of plate on the back of the car. Well, this is interesting. Here's the rear number plate on this car. There's no dealer's name, there's no phone number. It's different, it's a replacement plate. I want to investigate whether this car had any sort of accident damage at the back, look inside the boot, look around and so on. And of course, there are other clues I can show you. Another good indication as to whether the car's had serious accident damage or not is to look at the glass. I can see the registration mark in this window, this window, and this window, and in fact on the windscreen. And I've checked the other side and it's on all the glass. Now that tells me that the glass is original, the car's not sustained serious accident, accident damage, and that's good news. While we're here, another thing we can check on this car is the paintwork. If we have a look here, if this panel, for instance, had been sprayed, I'd expect to see a ridge in here somewhere. There's no ridge, and while there are a few marks here from chipping, I think this car's original, and I like that. Doors can tell us a lot about accident damage. Look at this one. It's been misaligned. There's a gap at the top, and it gets wider as it goes down the side and tapers off at the bottom. If I open the door, you can expect to see wear marks. Indeed, on this model, there is. There's a wide line there where the paint is actually rubbed away. Also, on the latch, there's overspray of blue paint. This car has definitely had paintwork sometime during its life. Well, what's even more revealing about this car is the tailgate. Let's have a look at this one. Down this side, there's a gap, and I can actually put my finger into it. I bet if we look over this side, it's tight. Indeed, I'm right. What that tells me is that this tailgate has been misaligned, which means it's probably been in an accident and therefore have had repair at some stage. Let's look inside for further evidence. What we're looking for are ripples in the floor plan. As you can see, there's a definite hump just here, and even more important, there's a big hole which indicates rust. I'd be very wary of buying a car in this condition. Another telltale sign are jig marks. This is where a car's been in an accident, the car's been put on the jig, and the chassis straightened. Look for indentations on the metal, where the clamp has actually pulled into the metal. That's a sure sign the car's been in a major smash at some time in its life. Another trick of the trade is to take a common garden fridge magnet with you and just put it against the metalwork. And if it sticks, you know the metalwork is sound. Go around the car and put it on various points of the car and make sure it sticks. And if we come up to the back here and stick it on, you'll see it won't stick. This car has been filled and it's fairly obvious from the cracks and from this dimple just here. Another test is also just to give it a tap. If it's a dull thud, you know that you've got filler in there. And if you've got a metallic sound, the car's perfectly sound. Ideally, you want to buy a car which has no rust at all. Now, this car's got some cosmetic rust here, which is not going to get better by itself. It's beginning to look a bit angry. And it makes me wonder about rust elsewhere. There's a bit on the sill here, which is not really good news. And if I stick my head under, yes, there's the beginnings of a nasty little rusty patch under there. So I'm beginning to cool off on this car. I think, um, I think we should have a look inside it. Yes, this is interesting. Uh, there's a nasty rusty patch at the bottom of the accelerator pedal and that seems to match the patch on the outside underneath the floor pan. So I don't like the look of this. This really warrants further investigation. Um, too much rust for me. So, to quickly recap, number plates and glass etchings are two clues to the true state of a car's bodywork. So are jig marks. Check them on the underside of the bottom sill and check door, bonnet and boot alignment look for those uneven gaps either side. And remember to take that fridge magnet with you to spot that dodgy filler. It may look okay now, but in the long run, it will start to crack up. So, with the bodywork checked out, 
what's next? Tires and exhausts, that's what. Tread on the tires to see how much it's been used. Probably, yeah, a bit worn. Probably a bit rusty, isn't it? <laughs> That looks like a world we're blowing. Those two should be the same, and those two should be the same. Burning oil in the engine. Yeah, they're quite hard. Tyres speak volumes about how a car has been looked after and how it's been driven, both of which have an impact on whether it represents a good buy or not. Douglas is the man to give us the lowdown on tyres. Tyres speak volumes about how, how a car has been both maintained and driven. If we take a look at this tyre here, it's a very old tyre. The major problem is that it's crazed on the sidewall, and we need to keep a careful eye on that one because it could deteriorate rapidly. It doesn't show any particular sign of driver abuse. Let's have a look at this front tyre here. Uh, another name brand, although a different name. Um, again, no sign of driver abuse. If there had been driver abuse, we'd expect to see scuffing here and maybe a lot of chamfering on this side of the tread. Again, it's a bit crazed, so it needs keeping an eye on, but it maybe helps corroborate the mileage, because these, these tyres have been on this car for a long time, so that indicates a low mileage car. Now, coming to this side of the car, we've got a pretty decent tyre here. It is a budget tyre. It doesn't show any crazing on the sidewalls. The fact that it's a budget tyre we, maybe indicates that the, the drivers had a limited budget, and it would be interesting to look at the maintenance records for the mechanicals on the car. Moving to the back here, yes, another budget tyre, but in fact we've got, um, we've got four different tyres on this car. If this is a performance car, that would be a problem. You'd want four matching tyres. As I've been going round, I've been checking that all the tyres are the same size. They are, in fact, all 17570R14s. And another feature which is worthy of note is that the wear pattern is relatively even, so that indicates no major problems with either tracking or suspension. Nothing special here in terms of the tyres, but no major problems either. Relatively satisfactory. This tyre is illegal. You can tell because it's almost bald. But if you're not absolutely certain, take a two-pence piece. It's a good rule of thumb guide. Place it in the tread, and if you can see the rim of the two-pence piece above the tyre, then you know that you're down below the legal limit. If it disappears, then you're usually OK. Just look at the tyre tread marks as well. In here, there is a mark. And once you get down to that level, once it becomes smooth, you know you're down to your legal limit. So therefore, look for that. Bear in mind that a new tyre can cost you from 50 to 150 pounds. If you have to replace four, that's an awful lot of cost on top of the car you've just purchased. Some performance cars are even more expensive than that. This particular tyre, well, it's ready for the scrap heap. Finally, check that you've got a spare tyre. But don't forget, if you get a tyre which may be old, it's going to cost you to replace it, just like the other four. Very important fact to remember. I'm not in love with this wheel, but I'm going to give it a hug, just to test for excessive play. This one's fine, but if it wasn't, we'd feel a little clickety-click -click movement, or in the worst case, a sort of banging sound coming from it. That could mean problems with the wheel bearings. As I say, this one's fine. Let's go and check the steering wheel. What I'm testing for here is any loud clonking noises coming from the steering column. That could indicate wheel bearing problems. This one's perfectly OK. So, you're looking for badly worn tyres that indicate a car that's been thrashed by a boy racer or has problems with its tracking. You're looking for tyres with a recognisable brand name as opposed to cheap imports because it may mean the owner not only skimped on the tyres but the service schedule and repairs as well. The tyre size numbers should all match. And don't forget to check the spare. And above all else, you've got to do the two pence test to see if the tyres are legal. Now it's time to peer closely underneath the car. Douglas has a view on what's a little iffy and what isn't. We need to check the condition of the exhaust on this car. Let's have a look. At first glance, it looks like good news because that looks like a new rear box. Make sure it's attached properly. Moving underneath the car a little bit, we need to have a look along and check if there's any bandages or filler which are try trying to um, uh, repair the exhaust. What I can spot in this one is a problem, actually, because the back box is new, but there is a problem with the middle section of this exhaust. It's, it's very rusty and, OK, a new back box, but you're going to have to spend some money to replace that middle stretch of exhaust because it doesn't look as if it's got much life, life left. Oh, and, and by the way, don't grab hold of these when they're hot. It'll hurt. 
Again, the advice is that if an exhaust is on its way out, that isn't necessarily a reason not to buy a car. But fitting a brand new exhaust isn't cheap, especially for larger family, executive and performance cars. So you'll need to add the cost of replacing an exhaust unless you can knock this expense off the selling price. And don't be too shy just to test the shocks. The car should give one solid bounce. If it keeps on bouncing, the shocks might be on their way out and then it's going to cost you. Having looked under the car, it's now time to peer into that most mysterious of places as far as the non-technical are concerned. The engine compartment. I would not know what to look at in there, no I wouldn't. Well, I used to be a mechanic, but uh, not to that extent. <laughs> I, don't got to I don't know anything about engines. Well, yeah, take the head off. Oh, this has got to come off. Surface history, I think, is very important. That engine's been replaced. There is none. Engines have become increasingly complicated in recent years. So much so, there's little the expert, let alone the layman, can see with the naked eye. However, forget all the wizardry like electronic engine management systems and the like. There are some telltale clues to serious problems that anyone can see for themselves. When you go and see the car for the first time, insist on seeing it with a cold engine. At the very least, it shouldn't have been driven for an hour or so before you get to see it. Never trust a car that has a hot engine when you view it. If there are any problems, anything from the fact that it won't start from cold to odd noises, a warm engine will hide a multitude of sins. And always insist on starting the car yourself. If it's a difficult starter for some reason, the seller may use a special trick to disguise the fact, something they probably won't tell you about. If there are always excuses as to why you can't examine and test drive from cold, it probably means the seller has something to hide. So get on your bike and look elsewhere. There are plenty of other fish in the sea. If the engine's been steam clean, many will advise you to stay clear of it. With the exception of Mercedes, which included in their service schedule, the recommendation is not to buy cars with steam-cleaned engines. It might have been done to wash away the marks left by serious and neglected oil or water leaks. But it can also wash away vital lubricants for minor parts, and more importantly, it can ruin some very expensive and complicated electronic management systems. And then you're talking big, big money to sort out that sort of problem. But what else can you see with your own eyes? Well, here's some very straightforward stuff you can easily check out. When assessing a car, it's very important to look at the engine and the engine bay. So let's start with the dipstick. What does this tell us? This looks reasonably OK. The oil's quite dark, but it's not too treacly. If it was very, very treacly, we'd suspect that the maintenance schedule hadn't been stuck to, the car had not been serviced properly, in which case we would not entertain it. It would be bad news. At the same time, people can think they're making an economy by putting in cheap oil, which we'd see just running off the dipstick. Cheap oil doesn't do the engine any favours either. I'm quite happy with this dipstick. It looks as if the car's been serviced properly, and we can corroborate that by moving to the oil filler cap. Again, what I see here is fine. There's no hard caked on deposits. There's no, there's no mayonnaise. So it bears out what the dip, dipstick told me. If there had been mayonnaise in here, I would expect there to be a problem whereby uh, water was getting mixed in with the oil, and if you see that, walk away from the car, because that is seriously bad news. I mentioned caked on oil. I can illustrate that here. An oil filler cap from another car. Now, this car, it can't have been maintained properly. Maybe it's been uh, a cheap oil put in it. Maybe it's missed its service intervals. But again, a false economy. And when you see that in a car, be very, very wary. It's not good news at all. The next thing to look at is the contents of the, the radiator and cooling system. What you expect to find in here, of course, is water and antifreeze. If you just find water alone, that's bad news, because in all likelihood the block will have corroded and could lead to an expensive bill at some point in the future. If you find, in addition to the water and the antifreeze, you find oil, again, that's a big problem, and again, it will show up as a mayonnaise-like substance on, on the inside of this cap. 
This one's okay, this one's fine, but if you dip a lollipop stick into a car and you find it comes out looking something like, like this, an emulsion of water, antifreeze, and oil, then that's bad news. You do not want that car. Walk away from it. While we're in here, we can look at some other items. We can have a look at the belts, make sure they're not damaged, make sure the tension's roughly right. We need to look at the chassis legs here, and similarly on this side. And what we want to see is a nice straight piece of metal, just the way it came out of the factory. If this is damaged or crumpled, we can suspect that the car's had major uh, accident damage at the front, and that's, that's a no-no. We don't want that. And while we're here too, we can have a look at the radiator hose. Fairly new car, but in an older car, you may, may have a problem. It may be perished, it may be cracked, it may leak. Um, check the radiator at the same time. And this one's nice and fresh, but again, it could be rusty, it could be leaking. Now, if there's a problem with either the, the hose or the radiator, you could be in for a breakdown, and that could uh, result in quite a large bill, as well as a lot of aggravation. A final word on the engine. It looks a little bit grubby. This car's been used, it's been on the road, it's had some water and muck come in. Uh, there's nothing to worry about here, it's perfectly normal. With the engine starting from cold, come round to the back and have a look at the exhaust pipe. A little bit of condensation coming out of the back is not a major problem, especially on a cold morning. You'd expect that, because it's hot air coming out of the engine. If you've got clouds of blue smoke coming out, that means you may have a major problem with the engine. Likewise, if you have clouds of white smoke, thick white smoke coming out, you have water ingression, another expensive bill is on its way. On older cars, you may get a little bit of black smoke coming out while the engine's warming up. That's nothing to worry about. Have a look. If you get clean water coming through the condensation, that's fine. There's nothing to worry about. You can expect little drops of water coming out. Pure condensation. This one's fine. There's not a problem with it. Here's another item. If your car's got power assisted steering, we need to check that. So with the engine running, come up and turn the wheel onto full lock. What you're listening for is a loud wailing noise coming from the pump. If you get that, that means you're going to have an expensive repair. It's on its way out. You may get a slight hissing, but that's nothing to worry about. This one's perfectly OK. We've now arrived at the running engine, which is now warming up after starting from cold. What we're listening for here is unevenness, coughing, spluttering, and any ticking noises that may be coming from the engine. You don't have to be an expert to hear these, and you would know about them straight away should you hear them. This engine is running absolutely perfectly, and is a classic example of what you should be looking for. It's nice and stable, there's not too much noise coming from it, and just listen to that tick over. This is a very nice example of what an engine should do. Another essential thing you need to check is the timing belt, sometimes referred to as the cam belt. This must be changed at regular intervals, maybe 50,000 miles, maybe three years. If it hasn't been changed and it breaks, you're heading for a big bill because the, the engine will be wrecked internally. You need to therefore look at the service records. If they don't tell you what you, what you need to know, check with the vendor, maybe ring the people who serviced the car in the past and make absolutely sure that the proper maintenance on the timing belt has been done. And once you own the vehicle, make sure that you get that belt changed at the appropriate intervals. There's a lot to take in there for the first time viewer, so it's worth running the program back for another look. Basically, avoid steam cleaned and hot engines. Check the radiator and water hoses for leaks and check the radiator for antifreeze. Look at the quality of the oil and for caking on the oil cap. Check the colour of the smoke coming out of the exhaust. White smoke is bad, so is blue and so is black if it continues after the engine is warmed up. Check any drive belts for cuts and tears. And you must ask if and when the cam belt has been replaced or at what mileage it is due for renewal. Finally, another small but important tip. Although the badge at the back may say that this car is a two litre, check the registration document to see if it says the same. It might just be a 1600 because, believe it or not, it's been known for the less than honest to change the badges to give an instant cosmetic upgrade and a corresponding upgrade in the price that you're asked to pay. Moving swiftly on, we come to a once-over of the interior. And again, clues abound to the true state of a car. 
Looks a bit messy in the front. Well, I've checked the mileage and how worn the seat was on the front. Now, the pedals seem to be replaced, I'd say. 51, that's about uh, 12,000 a year, isn't it? Well, they looked after it all, possibly, being a company car. Yeah, I think the interior is better than what I'd expect. The moment you sit inside a car, the number one priority here is seat belts. Are they working properly? Check all the seat adjustments. Do the front seats engage solidly? Does the seat still support you firmly? You don't want a saggy seat. Are there any cigarette burns or other irritating damage? Of course, seats can be replaced but at what cost? Turn the ignition key on. Are all the warning lights coming on? And are they going off as they should? The oil and ignition lights should extinguish fairly rapidly, followed by the ABS brake light and airbag light, if applicable. If they stay on, it could suggest a future problem that's expensive to repair, and in the case of the ABS or airbag, could even cost you your life in an emergency. If the warning lights don't go out when you start the engine or are doing a good impression of a disco, get out and drive home. You definitely don't need this car. Is the heater fan working properly? Does it blow both cold and hot? Don't assume it, check it out. Then, of course, there's the much talked about mileage. Is that figure on the clock genuine? It's one of the biggest fears you have when you go to buy a used car. So, what do the experts have to say? Not every car indicates its true mileage, and even for the experts, it can be quite difficult to tell. However, this car here in front of us looks very clean and tidy. There's no stone chips across the bonnet. The tires and wheels look in good condition. But let's take a look inside and see what that tells us. Surprisingly, this car shows 111,000 miles. Now, from the exterior condition, if it had said 50 or maybe 60, uh, I would have believed it. So, um, there is a possibility that a car like this could have been clocked, but it doesn't seem the case here. In order to confirm your, your views on the mileage, take a look round the interior. Um, this steering wheel's not particularly worn, but it's a bit shiny. Um, the pedals show some wear down there. The gear change doesn't show much wear. But, on the other hand, the, the handbrake's got a bit of wear here. So, those are the sorts of clues to look for. You can also feel how baggy the seat is. You can look at the trim, see if it's worn. And there'll be various signs. Look at the headlining up here, just to see how much use the car's had. In a day and age when even electronic myelometers can be very easily reprogrammed by the unscrupulous, it's no good getting paranoid about fiddled mileage. Even the experts get defeated on this issue and can only make educated guesses. All you can do is take heed of the tips just been given and use your own best judgment. Now the time has come to test the gearbox, handbrake and clutch. Let's start with the gearbox. With the engine running, depress the clutch and just run through the gears. You're looking for excessive stiffness and clunking as it goes into gears. As you can see, this one's fine and we haven't got a problem. Handbrake. Handbrake should come up to 45 degrees and should lock the car. An easy test for this and at the same time to test the clutch is with the engine running, put the car into first gear and let out the clutch. The engine should stall like this. If we had a loud screaming noise coming from the engine, that means that your clutch is in need of repair and could be very expensive. Also, if the car had run on, obviously your handbrake wouldn't be holding and again you're in for a major expense having this repaired. And just remember, when you try this test, make sure there's not a car in front of you. It could be a bit of a problem. A simple test there to check the handbrake and clutch. So far though, all you've done is investigate the paperwork and look around the car. It may seem tedious, but it's ever so important. But now, we come to the big moment we've all been waiting for. The test drive. Well, it's even worse, it's passing the MOC. 
I uh, probably myself feel more comfortable taking it for a test drive rather than looking at the engine because I wouldn't really know what I was looking for. Let go of the steering wheel for, for a few minutes just to see whether it's pulling to one side or not. Try an emergency stop. So, if you've got this far, you're doing well. But the proof of the pudding is in the test drive. So what's Douglas looking for? Before you set out on any test drive, make sure you're properly insured to drive the car. Remember when you're test driving, keep an eye on the traffic. To test the brakes, you need to apply them firmly and at the same time you can take your hand more or less off the steering wheel and make sure that the car slows down in a straight line. Nice even braking effect. Pull away in first gear in the car. You'll notice the clutch engaging, should engage smoothly. You'll notice the throttle action changed into second there. And you want no crunching into third again, no crunching. Checking that the synchro mesh works. And then into fourth gear. You'll get an impression of the smoothness which you, the clutch pedal moves with. It should be smooth. It might be quite heavy in some cars. Every now and again, glance at the dash and make sure there's no warning lights red lights coming on and here's a chance to test the suspension we'll go all the way around it make sure the car feels firm steering feels as if it's working properly we get a chance to assess the suspension and dampers there there was no indication of a wheel pattering up and down over the bumps if there had been a shock absorber it was probably on its last legs yes yeah, so all the time listen out for those untoward noises you can you can have gearbox whines, you can have suspension clonks, you could have trim that's rattling and buzzing, especially in an older car. If you hear really serious noises, it's um, maybe be wise to pull over and uh, investigate because a serious noise could actually be dangerous. Also, when you put the brakes on, as, as well as noting that the car goes in a straight line under braking, you'd be listening out for squeals or, uh, the worst case, would be grinding, where um, you've got metal-to-metal -metal contact, which is serious bad news and would indicate the end of the test drive. When you come back from the test drive, it's time for the final section, which is all about ownership and calling the seller's bluff. Do a check on it, HPI, it's like that. It's easier to change a registration plate than it is to to change the whole set of windows. So genuine books, etc. Yeah, yeah. I'd get the AA to come and check it over. How do you know that you are the person on the registration document? Because there's no, there's no photograph. Go and check it out first. If you like the car but feel unsure about something and have a gut feeling that something just isn't quite right, then either say thank you but no thank you and walk off into the sunset or call his bluff. If you can afford it, it's worth having one of the motoring organisations undertake a full inspection and a sincere seller will have no qualms about letting you do that. Even if you can't afford an inspection, threaten with one. It should help separate the honourable from the dishonourable. Likewise, you can ask to put the car through an MOT in their presence. If it's about to run out, it's worth doing this anyway. This won't find major faults like scum in the engine oil, but it will tell you if the car is roadworthy and legal. Again, the devious and the dodgy won't be happy at the prospect, and if there's something serious to hide, they'll probably make a pathetic excuse. Then, get marching. If the car has an electronic engine management system, ask to take it for a quick diagnostic check at the nearest authorised dealer, if there is one in the area. That will help to reveal problems or potential problems. Again, if there's nothing to hide, the genuine seller can't possibly object. Now, even though you've been sensible and checked the paperwork before you began, before you hand over any cash, have the car's details run through one of the organisations that maintain a database of information on cars. One telephone call and a small charge to your credit card can reveal whether finance is still owed on the car, 
if it's been in a major accident or been a write-off and totally rebuilt. Something that may affect your decision to buy or not. You'll find the telephone numbers for these organisations in any of the main motoring magazines or the buyer's guides. But, I hasten to add, the systems aren't infallible, but it's better than nothing. If you intend to take a friend or a relative or someone who professes to be an expert with you to view cars for sale, let them have a good look at this programme too. Go through it at least a couple of times together and make notes so you've got a crafty checklist on what to look for and in what order. Mind you, in a way, sometimes it's advisable not to take anyone along with you. If you relied on poor old Uncle Bob to tell you whether the car was a nice little runner or not, and it turns out to be the worst buy of your life, who are you going to blame? So, there you have it. A simple and straightforward guide to what to look out for in your next used car. As I said right at the beginning of this programme, this video can't be the definitive guide. All we can hope to do is to help steer you in the right direction so you can make a better and more informed choice. And hopefully that's exactly what you'll do now you've watched this video. So in the meantime, from Douglas, Gary and myself, good luck and safe motoring. And as you're going to watch this programme for a second and third time, I'll see you again at the beginning of the tape.